Hello and welcome to the youth political podcast that is Politibabble, where this week we're looking at electoral reform, specifically that of proportional representation. I'm Archibald Elliott, and as usual I'm joined by my top-notch uh, co-host, Oliver Sykes. Uh, and we're also joined by the leader of the Isle of Man Green Party, Andrew Langan-Newton. Welcome, welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so this week we have a guest on, uh, uh, Andrew from the Isle of Man Green Party. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we have, obviously, the question we asked to all of our guests at the start of the show. If you were a cake, what cake would you be? Maybe this might derive some controversy, but or controversy. Um, I would choose an oat cake, and the reason for it is I see it as a, a staple crop, um, a real cornerstone of the Isle of Man agriculture, its history, and um, a crop which is versatile. We can use it for many things. Um, you could have Max cheese on it, for instance, or you could turn it into oat milk, or um, you could um, have it as porridge. Um, so it's a real staple um, core of our society, and I, um, I think we inc- should encourage its um, agriculture in the Isle of Man. I think that probably is the best shaped answer we have on a cake <laughs> question on the time so far, yes. Indeed, uh, yes. yeah, I would, I would agree good. with that. I yeah. do love an oat cake. They, they especially, go, yeah, especially very, with a Manx cheese mm. on there. Oh, yes. Although I, got, I know I got, you're not a fan my, of Manx my, cheese. My, 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 brew, brew myself, I think I'd put on an oat cake. Yes, brew some radish. Lovely. Yes, lovely stuff. Do, do like a good oat cake. So, yes, uh, if you want to introduce yourself, Andrew, do... Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm the leader of the Alaman Green Party. Uh, the Green Party has been running since August 2016, um, coming up to six years. Just prior to the last, uh, the, the 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 not the last general election, of course, that was last year, but the one before it. And um, we have five politicians in the Isle of Man. We've run twelve candidates in that time, and um, we've been building a following around the core sustainability. For the future of the Isle of Man, we have six principles of the party, sustainability, non-violence, ecological wisdom, social justice, uh, respect for diversity, and um, and a democratic proportional representation, which is what the thing we're going to be talking about today. Indeed, that's right. And obviously, we're, we'll come on to the Isle of Man Green Party uh, further on in the show. Um, but firstly, Andrew, explain to us, as we are a youth political podcast, we're all about breaking things down. What is proportional representation? So um, I guess where we start with is um, is democracy in itself. And we, we elect people to represent ourselves. We are a representative democracy. Um, we um, represent politicians who, who then uh, f- d- define our constitution with the laws they pass as the, the sovereign body, Timwald, as, as we're aware. And um, so that has the core um, lawmaking function within our constitution. And um, to elect the people that represent us, we have elections. Uh, and in that election, we have followed in the Isle of Man, uh, except for a period of history, which I'll go on to talk about, um, the first past the post system. Um, so if you have one candidate, we have now elections of two candidates. You vote for the two people that you want to elect and the people um, with the most votes, um, the people in the horse race first past the post, um, they get elected. So um, the question about proportional representation is um, looking for a system that is the best system that represents the uh, diversity of our society and um, proportional representative representation goes towards that it's changing that vote system from a first past the post system to another type of system we have three real examples of proportional representation we have um, the um, uh, what's it called party lists so you really vote for a party and that's really for a system where you have lots of political parties and and you vote for the party um and in that system the parties that gets the most votes they have a proportion of their candidates elected into the parliament um then the second type is a hybrid between that system and um the single transferable vote system which is the final system which the isle of man did have for a period of 10 years um for for two elections i think it was in that 10-year period um and that hybrid system is really you get 
there's different variations of this, but you get two votes. You vote for the favourite political party and you vote for the favourite candidate. And so you get an outcome where you have um, maybe a candidate representing an area, but then you have a parliament which also has a section of those seats built up by the proportion of political party candidates um, re representing the amount or in proportion to that second vote you've got. So you vote for a person, you vote for a party. And then the final version is single transferable vote, uh, which is often described as a preferential rather than a proportional system. And in that you get one vote, but then a number of preferences. So you vote for the person you want to elect first, but maybe you've got five candidates and you rank them with preference to who you'd want your vote to go next uh, from one to five. Um, and that was, as I said earlier, was the system that the Isle of Man had for a decade. Um, um, it was brought in on the basis that it was going to be a fairer system. It was going to be more proportional, um, providing, a represent providing a representation in our um, sovereign lawmaking body, Timwald, uh, well, the House of Keys, the um, popular elected chamber of Timwald, um, which better represented the preference and the plurality of our society, um, the variety of different views in our society and political uh, stripes or um, affiliations. Um, however, um, that was... Um, overturned in, I think, 1995, and we can go on to discuss maybe why that was first introduced and then why it was overturned and why we should maybe think about going back to it now. Well, I suppose... The, oh, <laughs> turn my microphone off. <laughs> uh, yes, it's very, very interesting. But I, I suppose the, the system you talk about where you have the, obviously the party lists and the individual constituency lists, I think that's very co uh, very similar to that of, I think, Scotland. I remember their election, they had the regional seats, the party seats, and then constituency seats. I think they have a three-tiered system from memory. Which which would you say, I think, would would the Isle of Man, Green Party, or even you suggest would be the most fair out of them? Then I think that would be good probably to analyse. I think it's really context-specific. And, and just your point on Scotland, it's, it's good that you've drew that, um, or you identified that. I think... There was a report in, in 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 for the UK, the Jenkins report, and that proposed something similar as mm. well, um, uh, which was a balance between voting one vote for your constituency and one vote for a political party that you might identify as representing your range of political views best, but then having a vote for someone you maybe thought is going to best represent your local constituency. Um, then you might be aware there was a referendum in the UK in 2011, I think, the AV referendum. Mm. But the AV referendum didn't represent the recommendations of the Jenkins report. It only went for the um, AV side, alternative vote side. So just voting for your local individual, much the same as a single transferable vote, but in a in a constituency with only one candidate, whereas in the Isle of Man we have uh, multiple uh, seat constituencies. Um, so, sorry. So, the, your question was a good one, which was, what would our what would the Isle of Man Green Party party called for? And I should say, um, just as a, a prefix mm. or preface, that across the globe, Green parties share the same. Um, principles and um, they've been calling for proportional representation in their various different um, national um, elections, uh, especially Canada and um, the UK and, um, and in the Isle of Man here. And I think for the Isle of Man, I think we would really identify the single transferable vote as the best system in a system where we don't have a strong heritage of political parties. Mm. Um, and um, so we have three political parties that run in elections, uh, Liberal Vannin and the Manx Labour Party and the Isle of Man Green Party. And um, so that wouldn't be a system that would best cater for the outcome for our society. Um, it would more be a system um, that would be one where we already have political parties like the United Kingdom. Um, so the single transferable vote would be the most suitable for the Isle of Man, in my view. Well, I suppose it, it does then remove the issue of the usual form, I think, what well, people associate with proportional representation, which is the 
you vote for a party usually and then the party gets presented to the seats. It would remove almost that disconnect posed there between, well, maybe we put in a party and there's have any parties, we put them in. It would remove almost the independence of independent MPs, which we have quite a lot of in the island, and also then the party is not having that connection to the constituency, which I think, again, is probably an important thing, especially in our island community, mm-hmm. having that connection between the voting in the constituency and then your MHK, which then comes out of it. But obviously, I think a system where it just had an island-wide list, I think Guernsey did a, a job in their last election. They had an island-wide list of candidates where you'd vote, I think, for 26 or however many it was. I think that's, that system is is flawed in a way because we have less of this connection to our politicians. Yes, we are an island where there's only 80,000 of us, but we still, I think, there is that almost local community spirit that still exists. I think with these uh, intractable, complex... Uh, political mm. problems, especially facing a, a small island community like ourselves, we need to start with principles. And to derive the principles, well, maybe we start with outcomes. Mm. What's the... And, and um, the uh, Aristotle, the for- forefather of uh, political thinking, or, or th- in his treatise on politics, the politics, he really starts with the idea that the uh, the whole concept of politics is about building the best society and um and building the best regime the best governance system in order to drive the best you know, what he coins the good for society that's the objective of society and we might be in various different interpretations of the good but if we look at politics as trying to build the best regime the best constitution that derives the best outcomes for our society. Um, If we start at that place and we analyse our political construction around that and derive the principles that form that, then we can have a better objective debate about what is good within our our novel society in the Isle of Man. And um, appreciating your observations about a connection to local community, but also identifying the role of the national politician and what they do for the good of our society and what they should be doing. Um, And um, that is um, uh, deliberating upon the important issues that are facing the whole society that transcend maybe the... um, uh, don't use this in the pejorative sense, but the parochial issues mm. um, that face local communities. Um, so we need to really understand, is our method of electing national politicians best suited for the outcome um, that we're deriving from their function as passing legislation that um, mm. derives the constitution of the island as a whole? Um, so uh, I'm not deriving a view either way, but I'm positing a question as to how we should approach how we then develop our constitution, how we develop our lawmaking body, the sovereign body, Timwald, um, to best deliver that outcome. I do. You do definitely pose a very, very interesting question there. It is. It, I think it would all come down to what do we really want the national politician to be? Because I think some would like their national politicians just to almost purport their constituency. I think that, mm-hmm. personally, I wouldn't say that's the best method. I think, yes, they are a constituency MP, or MHK, not, not, not UK. <laughs> they are a constituency at MHK, and yes, they do have a role in the local community. But if we are, as you say, to elect a national politician to deal with the national issues, then maybe it isn't best to have a constituency f- maybe figure in the national sphere because they aren't acting on the best interest of the nation. They'll be looking maybe at their constituency. But... Again, it poses the question, then should we maybe devolve more to local governments and have local governments deal with the in-house constituency issues, more like a a local national version Mm. of the government, but for local issues, and have a local government, and then have this national government that is, again, as you say, elected almost independently from the constituencies, or in case, I think, with the... I, I know there's a a single transferable vote, I know there's (laughs) STV. Um, that, That system there, again would be better. I think it does come down to, again, as you say, the national what is national politician? What do we decide? What do we want out of our politics? And I think that's again something to if we were to look at implementing uh, a sort of a PR system into it and what we want out of national politics, it I think it would be quite a 
a tall order, if we were to even get uh, independent chair in to look at what does the island actually want? Because I think many of the people themselves as voters, we don't know because, again, Oliver and I did a campaign on this. The political education isn't there it's to know there. what we want as a national politician. So it is almost posing we would want almost you'd want a series of referendums <laughs> asking, well, what would you want out of your national politician? Well, if you want you out of a national politician this, then we'd go to this system, then we'd go to this system. But it's almost it, it would surely take a lot of work to, to derive what we want from a national politician. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not a huge advocate for referendum. Mm. Um but well, they are uh, contentious issues. Yeah, mm. and Switzerland yeah. yeah. have got a, mm. a process where they do have many referendums. But um, um, going back to Aristotle, I think he defined the um, the separation of powers into the the justice uh, execution of the law uh, and the um, the governance system, the execution of the government um, in. Um, executing the laws but then the sovereign body being the deliberative body uh, deliberating upon the issues and, and then um, passing laws and um, so in in these complex problems we need a forum we need a body that deliberates upon these issues um, but that's not to say what we have at the moment is the best thing for the Isle of Man um, and um, I think having what we describe as civil assemblies is a good way of enhancing the ability for the the wider politician uh, populace to engage with um these political issues and um um yeah so um what i wanted to say also was um was to look at um these this has been a great point to think about um, the the reason we how we have our governance system and how we elect them and obviously proportional representation is is a big part of that but there was there were some important reasons why they brought in the original um, um, single transferable vote and there there was a report called the Butler Commission I think it was in the late seventies uh, and they made recommendations to have um, um, multi constituencies and equal constituencies like what we have now with um two people in mm -hmm. each constituency i think there was um there was a lot of inequality at that time for example you had areas in the north of the island which had um a number of mhks representing very few people and mm. i think douglas north was one constituency that had a, a vast population within it but only one mhk so mm. you had um, great un inequality between different areas and, and that obviously affected how those people were represented in Timwald in the House of Keys um, and so this Butler Commission looked long and hard at these issues and it proposed the single transferable vote um, as it saw it as a fairer method, method that would um, better represent the, the as I said earlier the sentiment, the political affiliation of mm. the people who are voting and if we have a system that better represents the views of our society it has more legitimacy in that sovereign chamber passing the laws um i think it was uh, thomas jefferson who de described that um uh, the strength of a governance uh, and the justice of it, the powers that it exercises is based on the consent of the population and that um consent um is derived on a number of things for example how many people the proportion of the electorate who vote and the isle of man has had a very low mm. proportion of people who vote i think it was about the low 50s like 53 percent or something like that i think maybe it was a similar vote that was in 2016 i think it was something similar last year um, I think compared against the UK, that's in the region of about 68%, 67%. So we're really falling down on engagement and therefore the consent of the people to the sovereign parliament, the House of Keys, and therefore the legitimacy of and the authority of that body to declare laws passing the Isle of Man. Um, we just want our, our sovereign body to be stronger, so we want more people engaging in that. Um, so that's one thing and also the um the proportional proportional method of voting um 
and the single transferable vote sought to remedy the situation, move from the first past the post to a fairer system and a juster system that better represented those range of views. And it was interesting having a look this week at some of the reasons why it was overturned. Um, mm. And I would question the legitimacy of those reasons, which was um, it, it was too complex. People don't understand it. Um, people go to the voting booth and um, they just vote for one person, for example. Now, I, I'm not clear on this, but my understanding is there were two elections where the single transferable mm. vote took place. I think 1986 and 1991, I think. Um, and in the first of those elections, I think it was the case uh, that, say, you were in a seat with two um, people who voted, who were running, um, who could be elected, but maybe you had five candidates. Mm. You had to vote for the two, at least two people. Otherwise, your ballot would be spoiled and it wouldn't be counted. And then they changed that in 1991 to you could plump, plump the vote. Sorry. So you could vote for one candidate, even if um, the you you were going to have two politicians elected in that constituency. And, and that, I, I understand, was one reason why the single transferable vote system was undermined. Um, because that it doesn't work like the first past the post where you can plump for a candidate. Mm. Um, really, you're exercising your preference. You vote once, but you go, well, that person doesn't get elected, or they do get elected, but someone else is also elected. I'm just showing my sentiment for the other people. And that's good. That's going, mm. maybe I've got 75% in favour of this person, but 25% in favour of that person. Um, so you get a better representation in our political institution, the House of Keys, the sovereign body within Timwalls in terms of the political, um, in terms of popular elected, um, representing the more plural range of views within our community. And that's better for giving legitimacy mm. to the body. But I've gone on on this point, <laughs> laboured the point. <laughs> uh, well, I should just say, so I think people, uh, some of the arguments against it, and it was overturned finally before the 1996 election in legislation that was passed in 1995, um, on the basis that entrenched views, uh, and I would say views that maybe uh, lacked a certain legitimacy or, or, or justification at least, um, they were legitimately held views by those people, but whether they were objectively legitimate is a questionable. And um, they um, too complex for the population. There was another argument raised that even if you had had the single transferable vote, the same people would have got elected via first past the post. So it was irrelevant. Um, and um, kind of like views that, indicated to me it's always been done this way why why should we change it people don't like change and um, the manx people don't like change um for example <laughs> i think i think it was t e. brown who said in the 19th century interestingly um uh, paraphrasing again aristotle man is not a political animal and uh, the manx man is not a political animal <laughs> it's an interesting quote i came across once um which I was somewhat surprised at because the Isle of Man has a very rich history of engaging with um, um, governance issues. So Tim Ward reputed to be the oldest um, parliament, although mm. clearly not a popularly elected parliament because mm -hmm. we only had popular elections since 1866. Um, um, Although although there was an attempt to bring in, interestingly, popular elections in the Isle of Man in 1580 by the governor at that time, um, or not, or maybe one of the Stanleys, I forget if it was um, the governor for the Stanleys mm. because they weren't always on island. Um, but um, if that had come in at that time, that would have been a very interesting development for the Isle of Man. Um, but um, anyway, I labour this point... Um, um, I, I don't my, my view personally is that the reasons why or the arguments proffered at the time that the single transferable vote was overturned um, was were were not objectively justifiable. No, I, I, I do see your point there. And it's 
with preferences, I think that's a key is a key point in voting because I know when I went up the ballot box in September, it was almost there was I know there's one candidate I won't, I won't say names I'm not revealing who I voted, but there's <laughs> one candidate who I preferred over the other, and I was like, well, I know I, ha- I have to vote for two, but I would only prefer one. But it would be better if almost I could mark, I could distribute what I want if you gave everyone like five votes and they could distribute it according to their preference and they like could put four in one box and one in another. It was distributed that way. Then I could show you my preference was really strong for this candidate. And mm-hmm. if everyone else who voted for that candidate thought, no, they're really strong, they might have got in. But the problem was, I think with our almost quasi, it's almost second, uh, to first two past the post we have here, I find it it's, it doesn't work so effectively because I, uh, there's, you, someone, I could vote for uh, candidate A and candidate B and I preferred candidate A. Another person could vote for candidate C and candidate A. Or everyone could, and you end up with a system where it's, I think, vastly unfair. And that is a big problem. I think referring to the uh, STV in the Isle of Man, it was, it, it was a, a 86, 86 and uh, 90, 91 they were used. But it was in the 86 election, I think, there was, there was a few candidates who stood purely on the uh, principle that, well, not, it wasn't purely, but in the manifesto it was almost, we don't want the STV. And then they set up a committee in 86 saying, we don't want the S- uh, STV. Uh, and the members of the committee, I think uh, one of them, uh, who was it who referred to it? Well, well, Cat Cannon was the chairman of the committee. But and they, they, well, so the membership of the committee, it was unsurprising what the result would be because they were all made of the people who opposed the mm-hmm. STV. Uh, and I think it was, um, who who was it that, and who was against it? There was an MHK who was, uh, oh, let me, I had it in my notes here. Oh, there was a uh, Mr. Victor Neal, who was one of the architects to change to the, the STV, was almost very scathing in saying the report should only be received and not accepted or not, not the bill should not go forward because the membership of the committee was basically made up just of the opponents to the STV. I think it was actually the, the chief minister, uh, Miles Walker, was actually in favour, uh, I think, of keeping the STV. So... It, it, it does almost seem like it was almost, we don't want change. It wasn't like, we'll give this a try and see how it goes at the first election and then say, we don't want an opinion. It was more like at the first election where it happened, let's not even give this a shot. I don't want it to change when we haven't seen how it works. And I think, although I'm generally on a larger scale in the UK, I, I wouldn't necessarily be such a supporter of a PR system, mainly because... There is a single part, single member constituencies, but in the island where we have almost this multi uh, well, dual, dual member constituencies, I think this idea of having a preference list is extremely important because it's not me saying I just put who I elect first and I just put one candidate on. I'm most likely going to put two, and in the UK I could at least say this is the candidate I want most. But even preferences there, I think they do have some weight. They do have some weight of saying I agree, as you said, seventy five percent with this candidate, twenty five percent with the other or even 75%, there's 60% with the other. It does almost aid the constituents in getting the best representation possible. Yeah, I've got a good observation on that, which was mm. the Douglas South election mm. oh, in yes. 2020, mm. where I think you had 10 candidates. Mm. Um, now, I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but as an illustration, yes. what could be the outcome is that the person who gets elected mm. has more votes against them than they yes, had for them. For them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And is that then best representing the preference of the people in that community um, who all those other people Mm. we don't know but they might have all been against as their second vote the person who got elected and if they had had an opportunity Mm. to transfer their vote to the person Mm. who was their second preference but maybe was just a tiny bit below their first preference that could have been the person who came second exactly, or yes. third. But it's, it's almost like we, we really don't want this person. I really don't want that person. Is, so I'm going to vote all the other two. But everyone votes a different other two. We always get this mix. I think they only, I think it was around like 15% of the vote they got. But it's, it's almost, if they get under, at least in the UK, they have, they people more use tactical voting. But you yeah. have the person who wins usually wins like 40% of their constituency or something. And again, in the cases where they're, they're, they're more split because the parties are all with very different policy. But people do use tactical voting. But I think the islands, it's... Because manifestos, lots of them are similar. And it is it is very important to have that preference because we have... We had Parliament... Tenure, and the turnout was very, very low for Douglas South, which, again, removes that legitimacy aspect we were talking about earlier. So I think yeah, preferences would, again, prevent that situation. Where it'd, be, it'd be really interesting to see if we had had a preference list what the change would be, even if we didn't use the preferences. So we just said, we just want to see how it would work as a 
idea as a principle. But we're not going to we're not going to implement it into the result. We just want to do it as a trial. So then no one's really unhappy because the result would be the same. And just see, would it really make a difference? I don't think the the testing's unfortunately not been done to show in the island would it make a difference in recent years. But I think, especially in, in my voting experience, I think it would make a difference. Uh, it w- because we can't really tactically vote on Ireland as much. Because, well, there's, well, as you said, there's 10 candidates in the constituency. And all of them, they're not, they're not parties. So it's hard to know exactly where they sit on certain issues. Uh, you make a, a very interesting, compelling case, though. Yeah, and you might mm. have a candidate who has a great policy but you don't like any of their other policies, and then you have another candidate who's maybe got two issues that you like, mm. and then you've got an issue, a candidate who's got three issues. Like, yeah. So you're like, he's one, she's mm. two, she's three. And then um, and then you'll be happier in the outcome, mm. maybe, by going, well, they have got some policies that at least I can support. But um, digital voting is going to be interesting because mm. this idea that single transferable vote it's too complex it's going to put too much pressure on our Mm. administrative system if we can um use technology leverage technology to um remedy that and and make voting quicker simplified and Mm. um more accessible to the population hopefully then we'll get more engagement so legitimacy of of the house of keys will be improved because we've got a greater proportion of people voting and then we can introduce this fairer, more just system of single transferable vote into the mm. Isle of Man, very simply. Um, so, um, I mean, technology is, with Moore's Law, is moving so quickly mm-hmm. that hopefully by the time we get round to the next election uh, in uh, four years' time, mm. um, we will... Um, we will have a system which will be single transferable vote and digital. I, I think even at the, the last election it could have been made digital if they'd wanted it to be. I think that there's, there's some cyber security experts who, was, who really said to the people who were saying, oh, it could be hacked and etc. Actually, the systems there, are, they're pretty secure. We, we, do our, we do our tax forms online. Mm-hmm. The we census so much, now. And they say, oh, but personal information could be leaked. Well, we do, every, we do sen- census information is much more personal. We do it, everything nearly online now. And again, it would make it a lot easier, especially for the younger population who are less likely to go and make the trek out to the village hall where they probably don't know where it is because, again, moving times have moved, times have changed. And it might make it more accessible to them. We might get more voting across the population, those who have maybe have to work weird hours and like, oh, it's a trek for me to get to my polling station near me. They can just do a simple tap on your phone. Um, even, I think, the idea, which I think we, we posed to some of the election people and said, well, couldn't we just have constituency where voting where you can vote to any polling station in your constituency well they trialed that this year didn't they in Douglas, uh, in Douglas South. South yeah I think yeah. It, it works much better as a system even because I know well I'm assigned to a polling station but actually another one is actually already on my commute it's already where I was going but I'd have to make I'd have to make a trip out of my way to go to a polling station I, I could be mm. wrong but I think from the um from the having mm. um any option to go to any polling station in the constituency that turnout in Douglas South compared to previous years and or across the island was sort of on the up. Because mm. uh, I suppose if people uh, are on their way to the shop and they think, oh, I'll just go head into yeah. the, the, the police station right there, or, oh, oh, I've got my polling card or whatever I do, oh, and just head straight in. It's a, sometimes a matter of convenience for people. And I suppose that's what we've got to do in these moving times. Is like you say with the digital voting, is we've got to move with the times and obviously living on the Isle of Man that's something that not many of our politicians want to do but I think, I think it's hybrid, got to be done hybrid, hybrid, hybrid. hybrid might work be where if people are oh, maybe technology adverse they don't use technology as some people don't they can have that system where they can choose to go. I probably still go vote in person because I, I'd feel. I feel uh, we I, talked about this, didn't we, with the but pen and pen, with pe- the, the pe- pencil. Pe- pe- pencil, but yeah. I think it would it would make it more accessible to the population. I think we do have a big problem at the moment with the legitimacy of elections because the turnout is just it, it's not very good at all. I think the youth turnout dropped about 0.1 percent. Luckily, yeah. it wasn't so. <laughs> it wasn't it dropped another five percent. But it's even in by-elections by especially, we have such a low turnout. I think the, the last by-election I read about was actually a UK by-election. But they only had like 25% turnout. Mm. And the person said they had they, they got the support of the constituents. I was like, well, you didn't win over... Like, they didn't win like all of the votes. So they have less than... Probably, they have probably like a 12.5% 
actually support them I mean, in, in voters. Yeah, so and I mean, crazy. in terms of local elections mm. over here, crikey, the, the turnout for them was appalling. I mean, for, well, for where I live... candidates as, for, well, yeah, as well. For yeah. where I live in Port Erin, yeah. there, was, there was nothing democratic about that at all. They went straight back in. Some of them went straight back in. Oh, um, my, my constituency yeah. didn't even have an election. Yeah. Which I find interesting because I still think... If you have an, if you you can't just appoint them. I, I unfortunately I, I was actually too young to stand. Otherwise, I would have just stood on principle to say <laughs> there should be an election yes. here to make it fair. Because why should I have commissioners going in who I might not necessarily want going in, but I don't have the chance to oppose them, and I I can't stand. And maybe I'm too busy or I'm offline. I can't commit to standing as commissioner, but I don't want to vote for them. Again, look, we have we have a, another problem with legitimacy. It's almost it would be better to have the election to say, and if you don't want any of the above candidates, tick this, and then we have to host another election to get candidates that's agreeable to it. When so you're over sixteen, so you couldn't. You what do you have to be? 18? You have to be eighteen to stand. You can vote. This is this is, this is another issue mm-hmm. I I found always found very confusing. It's almost I can vote at sixteen, uh, but you can't stand to be over eighteen. So now if it happened, I would just go go and stand, but. It, it just it just it just doesn't make sense because if there's, a, if there's no candidates there supporting my point of view in election, I don't. None of them support what I want. None of them support what I want. Why would I go and vote? It wouldn't inspire me to vote, and I couldn't go and say I shall stand because no one's supporting my views. And other people might actually support my views. They're just like I I equally can't stand or I don't want to stand. And it's that disconnect there. I think it's very it's very confusing i can understand why maybe ledgeco has 21 as its age bracket mm-hmm. or something they want maybe more experienced people in there but as the, the democratically elected if you can vote you surely should be able to stand it, it is just it's very very silly to, to put yes, it yeah. uh, blankly i would echo that mm, yeah. yeah going back to your point about security i think we need to take a risk based mm. approach and is there a material risk that our election is going to be undermined by foreign influence, for example, or special interest? Um, and we measure that risk and we employ appropriate safeguards. Um, but to dismiss the idea yeah. out of hand because there might be this veiled threat, um, I, I, I don't accept that. I know, it's the same here. It's, 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 there's elections across the world which uh, run on paper and still have a balance yeah. stuff happen. Uh, especially, uh, I think, well, a certain country, I won't, I won't name them to go and have, or, 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 or we'll be talked by cyber attack <laughs> if we do. But there's, there's, there's the ballot initiative, and the, the dictators, and they stuff the ballot boxes. And you almost, you know it's silly when they get 97.6% support them. Yeah. It's almost, at least if you, at least I know, if, if you're going to fix an election, you at least make it realistic. So it could have happened, but it's bad. It, you can rig an election either way. Even with looking, I think the there was uh, accusations. I think with the twenty sixteen US election that it was almost rigged uh, by maybe, but that's maybe by social media influence. So it's it's not the ballot box which I think is the issue. It's not at the voting station. It's almost what's behind the scenes with maybe Russian troll farms, which have more of an influence. So I totally agree. I think the idea that our cyber security wouldn't be adequate for it is quite frankly ridiculous because if it if it's a cyber security issue then we just host a new election in paper form if it was such a big issue yeah i think that's a good illustration of a failed pseudo democratic mm. democratic state if you've got very centralized bodies of power um too much power centralized in maybe one individual mm. or a, no, a small number of um, oligopoly, if you will, um, a number of individuals, um, then that's not a system that represents mm. or, sh- or seemingly prima facie represents the diversity of our societies that we all see around us. We um, we all share certain characteristics. We also have a, a great diversity that should be celebrated. And that's really the essence of this idea about proportional representation. If we have a political structure that has a safe environment to hear the diversity of views and deliberate upon them and declare laws that best represent that diversity of um of views and sentiments, then, then in my view, that and the Green Party across the world describe this. Um, our view is that that better caters for the society, better derives outcomes that, as Aristotle said, provides the good in society, the outcome that's best positive for our community. 
And also, do you make a persuasive case for the <laughs> issue of proportional representation? I think uh, I think it's the they may need to sum up because we can probably sum this up now. I think for a single transfer work, I think would would probably persuade me. I, I'm, yeah, I, I wasn't uh, indeed. I'm not. I wasn't. I'm not. I'm still not particularly sold on the idea <laughs> of having the parties and the percentage get the seats because I think that removes that disconnect, which I think is so important in politics. That connection with. With the, with the person you're voting for. But I think the single transfer vote would probably, here at least on Ireland, protect both the identity of having, we know our MHK and we vote for them, and protect the in, in, having independent MHKs, which I think does make our system almost unique because we are in the majority independent. I know you're a party politician yourself, <laughs> but I, 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 I like that mix there we have on Ireland. Um, and also, it really protects the interest of the voters to make sure that, again, we don't have a case where, like Douglas South, we don't know what could have happened. We don't know if the majority vote against someone, well, almost because they're, <laughs> they've they got 0.1% more they get in, even though if we look at it, because such a low turnout and so many candidates, it would be much better, I think, especially in the island to have a preference system, especially, I think, with our two seats constituencies, it almost does have a much stronger case. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I definitely agree with most of the points that, that you've been, uh, you know, that you've, you've said, uh, along with, with Archie's points as well. I think um, that we do need to constantly think about the way that we are governed uh, and rather less so focusing on policy. I think Timwald um, is not too keen on reviewing how things uh, operate rather than um, looking at policies mm. and you know the, the there's a massive focus on what the role of the executive is actually doing rather than like you say um, the ability for people that are age 16 who can vote to not be able to stand um, well, I think the, the policies they're looking at currently they're it's they're not but I, I think they've got their priorities wrong <laughs> I, I, again I'm I, I think this government does a better job than the last one, but I still think the priorities are, are wrong on the scale because they're they're focusing on I think climate change again. I'm I think it's well, it's, be, we're it focusing the on the critical issues yeah. of the day, which seems but, to be echoes. But, so yes, but lost. it's 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 almost there's so many issues where they've not even put in a manifesto for government to deal with, and it's almost wouldn't we it's not like no one's been talking about it even politicians are like yes i think that's a bit bit odd to have you can stand that uh, you can vote at 16 sta- only stand 18 so i i, I find it is it's always a difficulty with government what to focus on but i don't i, I, I think the focus isn't clear uh, currently especially i think they're trying to get almost uh, continuity between the whole parliament which i don't i think it would work better almost as a system where you have your government and you have an effective opposition to scrutinise the legislation, you can scrutinise what the government wants to put in as its policy and say, well I don't think you should be putting in this policy, I think this would be a better policy or this would be a better policy, you, you shouldn't be doing that but almost it seems very collaborative at the moment and it's almost like we don't really have anyone criticising or scrutinising to the full degree because they're all the ones which maybe would on certain issues but not on others because they're important to parliament, it comes to the whole the interesting uh, convolu- uh, convoluted uh, Max political system. Well, yeah. I think it would be a good time to now move on to the Alaman. Unless you have anything Green- to, yeah. Unless you have out. anything further to yes. add. No, I think <laughs> you've just touched Archie upon a very <laughs> important subject about the separation of powers, but that could take up a whole different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. so, uh, yeah, I won't yeah, delve into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. but we'll have a, a quick focus on on the Alaman Green Party and where it's at. So, in terms of um, sort of positions that are currently uh, sort of undertaken and sort of uh, people in, in elected as politicians. Do you envisage that at more elections you're hoping to put in more people or are you just focusing for specific areas or potentially by-elections if, if they come about? Um, we have, um, I guess, hmm, maybe if I limit it to three things, um, running candidates fundamental to the function of the party. Um, so... Um, when by-elections come up and then there'll be the local elections in three years three and a half years um um but so building um to that um providing a safe environment where members can come forward and and learn about the role of being a local politician and um, we have five local politicians in the party in middle patrick ramsey and two and douglas and 
Um, so, yes, and there'll be by-elections mm -hmm. um, um, coming up. I think you've referenced already a number of places where there might not be full catering of candidates, of 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 local politicians, so there might be elections mm. in those constituencies. Um, so, yeah, so number one, um, provide a forum, um, a, a, an environment where people can learn to be a candidate and then hopefully run on behalf of the party. Um, number two, um, engage with the population around the, wor around the world, around the island, <laughs> um, um, hosting meetings, um, learning, and then also at the same time artic articulating the Green Party's positions uh, uh, on, on the universal issues that are facing the island and the world. Um, and then lastly, um, building our policy portfolio. And we've got, uh, especially on energy and transport, we have got, um, we've been doing a lot of work on those areas, which we hopefully will be uh, publishing important documents on those areas. Like we published a document in January called the second carbon budget for the Isle of Man, mm. um, which really sets out timelines for action based around the science of climate change. But now we are producing documents building how is that action delivered and crucially on energy, um, especially given the announcements in Timwald this week around when the Isle of Man government will be proposing their energy um, programmes to Timwald for approval. Um, the Green Party or, or have got documents um, well developed, which we will hopefully be publishing, which will set out that we have the resources around us, not the gas allegedly mm. off um, Mackle's head, but actually in the sun, in the uh, wind and in the tides and the waves in the Isle of Man. We, we have the capacity in those resources to produce enough energy to power the Isle of Man. We know that. Um, it's just a question of storing that energy for when demand is um, requires it. Um, and um, we already know how we can do that by these places around the world already solving those problems about demand management um, and capacity management and grid storage in a variety of mm. different methods from hydrogen, from uh, f flow batteries, from um, sodium batteries, from um, small scale lithium ion batteries to larger scale lithium ion batteries. Um, so, um, that's going to be a very important document that will inform the debate in the Isle of Man on energy. Um, so, yeah, we have our work cut out. We've got members who join the party all the time, which is great to see. Um, and we have got a website at www.greenparty.im www where we publish this information. You can find out about us also on social media, on Facebook, on, on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, so, really... Producing policies to inform the debate and stimulate the debate around these issues, like what we've talked about tonight. How do we better um, govern the society in a, in a more just and equitable fashion that's more inclusive and benefits the outcomes that our society is seeking for it, the sustainable outcomes for our society? Um, running candidates to... Um, um, not only convey that message, but also be in positions of authority to bring it to effect into terms of policy in the Isle of Man at a local and uh, the national level. Um, and um, yeah, so that's where we're at and mm. we've got lots of work to do. Um, well, very good. Yes, that sounds um, like exciting stuff for the Green Party then, yes. No, it's, 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 it is always interesting hear, hearing the political parties in the Isle of Man, I suppose, are they've not been so pushed forward. I think in recent years they've waned, but I think they are probably sincere resurgence in a way. Mm -hmm. um, as I I think the youth, the youth look, they, they, they don't necessarily know the people in the constituency who stand, I think, as, as time goes on. Because, again, I think people historically are dying, they're elected because they're known in the community and people know them, they do a, a good job or propose good job. I think party politics probably will have a larger role I, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, uh, mainly as a party politician, we might play a bigger role in the future, would you say? Uh, potentially. I mm. mean, um, I, I see, we talked earlier about uh, this long debate around uh, an island plan, for example, mm. that's going on valuable parliamentary yes. time, valuable government time. And really, we see the uh, political parties as a way to present those plans to the electorate 
and then go out mm. and deliver them. Or um, And so that's the great value. Transparency about how we're going to govern our society when, when you're at the ballot box, knowing what these political parties are already... Um, what they're justified on their philosophy and then how they are going to deliver that philosophy in terms of the policy that represent the philosophy. Um, and so that's great for, for democracy, transparency. And then with that transparency, you get accountability, mm. holding those political parties accountable to what they had said. Well, you said this, you had this plan, this program, and you haven't delivered on it. Um, and a much more f efficient and uh, productive outcome in our political system in bringing those plans to effect. Um, and or, or a, a pluralist outcome of those plans if you get a number of political parties which form coalitions um, through systems of proportional representation. Um, so in the future, do I think... Um, well, there's great scope for that to be delivered because we're witnessing the mm. effect of its absence right now or its omission because um, we have politicians that extend... Uh, this plan is going to maybe come to Timwald after the energy, uh, the climate change mm. pr program, I think, maybe. Um, so that might be coming up close to a year after the election, um, not quite a year of its prior to the August recess, mm. um, but, or the July recess, whenever it is. Um, um, but that's been a wasted opportunity if mm. there isn't that strategic direction being delivered now today with a clear plan for how we are going to govern the Isle of Man, how we are going to deliver the good for the Isle of Man in terms of those outcomes, which we should say should be the sustainable development of the Isle of Man and a more inclusive, socially just society um, that balances our, appropriately balances our relationship with nature to, to avoid... Um, e the outcomes such as um, environmental damage and degradation and climate change. Um, will that come? Well, that's really up to us as mm. the Green Party. And we would encourage other political parties. The Green Party don't have all the answers. We want to be part of a system that is an inclusive system, that's a socially just system. And um, we would like that to be formed by having transparent elections for the for the polity in the Isle of Man, the electorate in the Isle of Man, and to be able to vote how they see fit as to the people, the um, organisations, the political parties best representing the interests of the Isle of Man. Um, so I'd encourage more people to get involved with political parties, to make them stronger, to make them more legitimate, the more mm. people who join. And um, if people are thinking about setting up political parties, I would encourage them to do that because that will benefit the outcome of transparency for the electorate. Um, yes, no, I, I, I entirely, I, I do see your point there with almost wasting a year, it's almost wasting a year of government time. It's almost, that, that, that is a, that's a, a fallacy of the Isle of, Man, Isle of Man's uh, political system almost. We have a group which come in, then they use about a month, uh, a few weeks, uh, this time is right, a month of parliamentary time to work out who's chief minister, decide on their chief minister, and then the chief minister has to then decide on a cabinet, and then they have to decide on an island plan, they consult for a while for an island plan, to so then produce an island plan, and then it has to get through all the stages, and then they finally, it takes so long to actually produce a piece of legislation from their plan, it's almost... Then they they produce the first piece of legislation, and then up for re-election re time. It's almost this, this very slow sluggish thing to get anything done i don't think it necessarily works in fast changing times like this we do need action in certain areas to just put in the base work quickly because the base work takes time to develop and to, plans take time to actually go into play with i think the island man government's notorious for being incredibly so we see the sea uh, the, fer the ferry terminal in liverpool or even the castle russian high school which was supposed to have already been built uh, even the road prom which went far over budget and over time then there's so many, we're very slow at acting, yet we say, yes, we will act, but we'll act a bit later. But we all know that later will be pushed back, however, more later. Uh, I think there, there's the case, I think, which we had on our news thing, uh, bulletin, which is the uh, the 2035 uh, carbon emissions interim target, rather than, I think, 2030, they pushed it back even fur further than what the consultation said and some protesters uh, from Extinction Rebellion were, were ejected from the Timwald courts in the gallery. For that, but I think again, it's that, that that is again an even more interesting point where the they put it out to consultation to see what's the public think, 
the public say in a majority, a small majority, we should have it earlier. But we're going to do it later anyway because we want to. So almost why bother putting out the public consultation to start? I absolutely agree. And uh, you touched upon earlier the um, separation of powers um, institutional failure the institution is perpetuating these problems these lack of accountability lack of holding a governance system which is there to execute the laws that are declared by parliament passed by the tim wald um, and we had lord liz vane um, who was brought over to the Isle of Man to absolutely engage with these issues produce a, a very important report on the constitution of the isle of man and um that in terms of its um, institutional issue, the balance between the government and the parliament um, was has been ignored. Um, and we don't have a separation of powers which is tenable, which is acceptable. And this is what Lord Liz Vane said. Um, as a developed democracy, it's, it's unacceptable to have... Um, in the region of 80% of your parliamentarians having paid membership of government departments. In the UK, they have a law, the 1975 Act, supplemented by another piece of legislation, which I forget the date of, and, and that limits the paid members of the House mm. of Commons, um, how many can be in the government, and I think it is something like 108 um so I think it works out as something like 18%. But it did remove, I think, at the now, for the, the, the current set of MHKs, they don't have a increase for being a member of the department. I think they, just, they increased the basic That's pace. positive. It's, yeah, it's, that it's was positive. a positive it's, development. It's, it's taken that out, which I think is very key, because before we had almost, oh, I don't want to vote against the government because I, I then lose a few thousand pounds mm. of my salary. It's almost that, that shouldn't be the case. It was holding the hostage. And it does, again, increase the basic pay of MHKs, which, again, maybe keeps backbench MHKs. They don't need to join government because there's not such that incentive there. So I think it, it, it's a, it is a positive step. Yeah. Yeah. So that probably wraps up uh, this episode of Political. It's wonderful having you on, Andrew. Thank you very much for, for agreeing to come on. Yeah, no, I'm really grateful, yeah, great. to both of you. And, um, yeah, thank you. It's been, it's been a great opportunity mm. for me to, um, to engage with this important issue further. Yes, there's been very interesting uh, chatting this week to Andrew Langan Newton, the leader of the Isle of Man Green Party. We'll be back next week. I'm not quite sure on the topic, but we shall be back next week with another episode uh, of your absolute favourite political podcast, uh, Politibabble. So thank you very much uh, for listening. You can check out our past episodes on manxradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash Politibabble, manxradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash Politibabble. Or, you know, do get in touch with us at Politibabble on most social media. And you know how to spell that because you're listening to the podcast, so it should be uh, just above on your screen. Uh, or you can email us at politibabble at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. You've been politibabbled. Thank <laughs> you.